Holy God, when the wind is loud, when the rain tears through the trees, when the storms of life hold our attention, draw us back to you. Still our hearts and quiet our minds, just as you did to the storm. Reach out your hand to us and pull us into your word so we might hear your message for us today. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are continuing our journey of wandering with Peter through various stages of his faith journey, various phases of his life as he wanders with Jesus and as we wander through Lent toward Easter. In today's reading, Matthew's Gospel recalls one of the most well-known miracles of Jesus. If you asked anybody in the world, Christian or not, what is one of his most famous miracles, people would say, walking on water. So, where are we in scripture? Where, where are we? What has happened and what is happening? At the end of chapter 13, Jesus has been finishing up. He's finishing up a lot of his parable, parables and teachings for his disciples and for the crowds. Chapter 14 begins with King Herod, the regional king, uh, and he was terrified of Jesus, which comes back later on Holy Week, uh, because he thought that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected. And this was something he was scared of because he had John the Baptist killed a little bit earlier. And this is important because at this moment, this is when Jesus finds out that his friend, his relative, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. So while Herod gets the heebie-jeebies at the name of Jesus, uh, Jesus finds out that he's lost a dear friend. Jesus is distressed, and he actually goes off on a boat and spends some time alone. As he returns to shore, he finds out that the crowds had been keeping an eye on him and watching as he floated along, and they gathered where he was about to disembark from his little boat. He felt sorry for them. He had compassion upon the crowds, and so he spent time teaching. As the day came to a close, 
He said, you all should go home. You need to eat at some point. And the disciples said, you, we can't just send them. There's nothing nearby. And so Jesus fed the 5,000. And this is the point when we get to our scripture. After having fed the 5,000, he puts his disciples in a boat and says, go on over to the other side, get things set up for when I arrive. They go and do that, or they, dis they take off to go and do that. Jesus dismisses the crowds, and then a distressed Jesus, still grieving, spends time alone in prayer. He was alone for several hours. The scripture says he was alone at, in the evening to pray. And at that point already, the disciples had been on the water for a bit. And at that point already, the waves had battered the boat. So those poor disciples had been on a wavy sea for quite some time. It says in the morning, the early hours of the morning. So the disciples have been on this boat now for probably close to, what, 10, 12 hours? Who knows? In a boat that may or may not be seaworthy any longer. They are waiting in the darkness of the center of some lake. They don't know where they are. There's no street lights. Can't see anything through the storm. Just as the sun is starting to rise, they see something on the horizon. It doesn't look like land. Maybe it's another boat. It's too tall to be a boat, though. And that's when all of the stories, all of the tales that they had been told, they're fishermen, after all. And people who work on the sea have stories of things they've seen in the oceans and in the waters. This is definitely a ghost. And so the disciples panic. Some versions of, this, of the Bible say that they screamed in terror. Truly, this was a terrifying experience until Jesus' words ring out across the waves and through the storm. Don't worry. Don't worry. They've been on a boat that's been battered for 12... Don't worry. It's me. Understandably, they didn't really believe it. And, Jesus, and Peter responds and says, if it is you, if it's you, you're walking on water. If it's you, this is kind of, this is a lot. This is, you are impressive. This is a big deal. If it is you, tell me to come join you. Jesus calls his bluff. Come, Jesus says. And so a man who has been on a boat, battered in the middle of a storm, who knows very well what happens when people go over the side of the boat and has spent most of his life successfully not going over the edge of the boat, in the middle of a storm, in a dark sea, steps out, crawls over the side of the boat, and doesn't fall down. He doesn't sink. He walked on water. Peter walked on water toward Jesus until he didn't. He saw the wind around him. He got distracted and scared and started to sink. Knowing how dangerous this was, he cried out for help. And that's when Jesus catches him and says, oh, Peter, why did you doubt? And again, I go back to why did he doubt? Because he knows very well what happens to people in oceans. Water is supposed to swallow you. You're supposed to work your way through water, not stand on top of it. Why did you doubt, Jesus says? You of little faith. So besides showing Jesus' incredible power and ability to do miracles that defy 
physics, all reason, and all logic, what is this story telling us? Perhaps this is a story about Jesus cranking up his training regimen for his disciples. In chapter 8 of Matthew, they were on a, in a boat on a stormy sea. Jesus was with them this time, and he was taking a nap in the lower deck. This is not a new experience to be in a stormy sea. Jesus calmed the storm that time, and in response, the disciples said, you must be someone impressive. You must be a prophet. Who are you? This doesn't really tell us much about us, though. So perhaps this isn't the point of this story. So maybe this story is about courage. Maybe this is a story to give us an idea of this, the kind of courage we need to have as followers of Christ. Peter had courage to step out of a boat when all logic defied that movement, that action. Being in a boat was Peter's life. He knew what happens if you step out. So he must have had a great courage to do so. But that doesn't quite work for us either because after he is saved by Jesus, does it mention Peter's courage? Does Jesus mention his courage? There must be something else in this story for us. Jesus says, you have so little faith. Meaning it was his faith that carried, that had him step out. It was his faith that was able to sustain him on top of the water. So if Jesus is talking about Peter's faith, why don't we start there? Peter's courage to step out of the boat is only possible because of the sliver of faith that he has. Jesus is doing it. If Jesus can walk on water, I've seen it, I believe it, Peter might have a sliver of faith that he could do it as well. If he had only a little more faith, he would have been able to go further. But who's his faith in, in that moment then? If his faith was in his own ability to step out, then he's having faith in himself. He would have to have faith that he could do it because Jesus could do it. This doesn't quite line up either. So where did Peter's faith, in order to keep him from sinking, come from? It's important to notice the logic of this passage. Peter had the courage to step out of the boat, and he was capable of walking on water because he had faith. He had faith, not that he could walk on water, rather, he had faith that Christ called him to walk on water, therefore, he could walk on water. Peter doesn't do this on his own volition. He doesn't just get out of the boat and start running toward Jesus. Jesus calls him, and he responds. Peter, having faith in himself, would have gone nowhere. Peter, having faith in Christ's call, that Christ would care for him and watch out for him as he did, as he responded in obedience, that is where his faith was. So Peter was called by Jesus to do something outrageous. He found the courage to respond in obedience because it, he had the faith that Jesus would make it happen or that Jesus would take care of him when he did respond. And the logic here is really important. If Jesus did not call him, Peter would have, or could have, fallen right down. He might not have even stepped on water at all. Jesus called and Peter responded in obedience. This strengthened his courage. This gave him that extra step of faith. He knew that Jesus would take care of him. An example for us. 
and I'm gonna take some liberties with the, I, I warned Webb that I would do this, but I'm gonna use the, the Arts Collective, the Irvington Arts Collective as an example. Last year, uh, Dr. Parker proposed the idea to our church of the idea of possibly maybe organizing something that might one day become, very, very couched in tentative possibility, a community arts organization. Something that was based out of our church. Um, and so our church said, we were kind of sitting at the same point that Peter was at. Standing on the edge of the boat or sitting near the edge of the boat and looking out and saying, what are we called to do? This was before I started working here. You were in the process of searching for a pastor. And the leadership and the congregation was sensing, what is God calling us to? The IAC, the Arts Collective, was a new idea. It was something that could engage the community. Something, that's something that we knew our church wanted to be a part of, engaging the community. It would use the facility that we have, one of our strongest resources, our best resources, and it would serve our neighbors, which is something else that this church really is passionate about doing. Now, if Session had said, let's go start an arts collective, Without Dr. Parker, that might not have been a great idea. We, we are not all individually equipped to do some of that. Dr. Parker was at a point in his life where his professional career, where his, uh, his journey had come to this point. This idea of starting a community arts program was something that he was passionate about and interested in. The church was at a point, he was at a point, there was a sense of call to start something. And the truth is that there is some sense of God calling the IAC into existence as this process unfolded. A calling that is heard again and again as we continue to unfold. The Holy Spirit moves in our community and we have community members showing up for the, the choir that is a part, a foundational part of the IAC. If I remember right, it's nearly 80% of the members of that choir are non-church members. They're community members. Am I right on that? Which is just outstanding. On the first night that they met, Dr. Parker was excited to see 10 people, and instead 40 showed up. Has it been a success? It's too early to know. But we see successful things happening. Peter had several steps on the water toward Jesus, and I like to think we're at that point right now. Things are working. We have grants that are sustaining that program. Activities are happening, and the promise of new things are on the horizon. We are responding collectively to God's call. Does that mean we're gonna follow Peter's footsteps and start sinking soon? Uh, no, we're, we're not going to say that. But we are saying that stepping out in faith is important. Having the courage to step out is also important, but all of this is rooted in responding to God's call. Responding to God's call to serve our community, to serve our neighbor, and to use the, the resources that we have and have been given in a way that glorifies God and that serves those around us. So we need to have, as a community and as individuals, we need to step out of the boat. We need to be prepared to step out of the boat. We need to do so not because we just want to get out of the boat, we need to do so when we are called and where we are called. Never limit your faith to your own cap capabilities. Never limit your faith to your own capabilities. Limit your faith to the one who is capable of all things. Have faith in God for if we start to stumble or fall, if we start to sink, if our faith is tied to ourselves, that could be trouble. But if our faith is tied to God, that hand will reach out and grab us and save us from whatever it is that is threatening our lives. 
Have faith in the one who always was. Have faith in the one who always is and who always will be. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.